Okay, welcome everyone. Um, I, I just want to warn people that I'm in the middle of a Scottish storm and uh, if I suddenly disappear it's because my Wi-Fi has died because of the power cut but hopefully I'll, I'll uh, maintain connection for the next hour. Um, so um, welcome to our Turing Spotlight session. So I'm Magnus Sorattre, I'm Director of our Institute for Data Science and AI and I'm also the um, Turing University lead for Manchester and uh, in these spotlight sessions we're introducing our new Turing fellows who are going to talk about their research and there'll be an opportunity for people to uh, ask questions at the end of each of these uh, two talks and today we've got a bit of a um, health theme um, so the two speakers today are from the School of Health and the Division for Informatics Imaging and Data Science in that school. And I'm very pleased to welcome Glenn Martin to talk first. And Glenn's going to talk about developing multivariate clinical prediction models for predicting multiple outcomes. And I should just say, if you have any questions, uh, it's a good idea to put them in the chat because then I can kind of uh, coordinate the Q&A at the end. Um, so just feel free to put them in the chat during the talk because it helps you remember your questions. And over to Glenn. Thanks Magnus and um, yeah great to be able to well virtually be here to, to give a talk uh, on some of my work and uh, look forward to the discussion afterwards. So as Magnus said um, a lot of my work is in the certainly in the health space uh, and more specifically uh, looking at uh, developing clinical prediction models uh, within that, that setting. So if we start by thinking about what a clinical prediction model is for anyone that's not familiar, um, well, this is essentially a, a screenshot of such a model called uh, QRISC. So if you type QRISC3 into, into Google, uh, one of the first hits of that will be uh, this web uh, calculator. And you can see here that uh, on the left-hand side, um, there's a collection of, of variables, uh, characteristics about, about the patient, um, and one can enter the information, uh, hit calculate risk, and out pops the, the risk of, in this case, 10-year uh, risk of having a heart attack or stroke. Uh, and you can see that on the, on the right-hand side here. And the reason I've used this uh, as an example is it's um, a type of prediction model that's used uh, within uh, clinical practice to, to guide statin use. But more generally, what a, a CPM is, is uh, essentially any statistical or machine learning model that takes a set of information about a patient as inputs and, and outputs the risk of some uh, event either being present, if it's a diagnostic model, or uh, whether it occurs in the future, if it's a prognostic model. And, and all of my research uh, centers on, on this idea of um, applying predictive modeling uh, within routinely collected observational health data. And what I see my, my work as being is, is split into to four parts, um, three of which are statistical or, or methodological, uh, and the fourth is more applied. But on the, the statistical side of things, so I'm interested in um, looking at how we can understand and then perhaps more importantly model observational processes um, within uh, prediction models. So by that what I mean is things such as uh, how we handle missing data when we're developing these models uh, and the analogue to that of um, when we have informative or adaptive observation, how we um, incorporate that information into prediction as well. The second and third stream are closely related, so uh, these are all around the, the idea of uh, applying methods to try and optimise the development uh, of the prediction models, and I'll talk majority about that stream uh, today. Um, but then also then when we have the prediction model developed, how do we use it in clinical practice uh, carefully uh, and uh, appropriately based on how well it, it performs. And then the fourth is, is actually the more applied angle of my work, and that's actually uh, developing these types of models for a range of different uh, clinical settings. But really, my 
talk today, I, I thought it would be useful just to focus on uh, one example of the work, and, and that's um, looking at this idea of, of multiple outcome uh, risk prediction. So if we think about how um, CPMs are currently developed and, and used, um, this happens in, in what I call sort of silos of, uh, of information. So generally what happens is uh, a prediction model uh, or a team of, of um, developers or modelers will develop a prediction model in isolation um, on a particular data set and focused on a uh, particular outcome. And so what results is a situation where we have, say, one model that aims to predict cardiovascular disease like uh, Q-Risk from a couple of slides ago, um, and then other models that each predict separate things. So there might be a, a, another model that's predicting the risk of, of chronic kidney disease. And this happens in, in pockets. Now that situation is perfectly fine and, and valid if, if all we're interested in is predicting the mar marginal risk of, of any one of those, of those outcomes. So if all I'm interested in saying is what is this patient's risk of developing cardiovascular disease in the next 10 years, irrespective of, of anything else that might happen about that patient, um, then this situation is okay. But it's probably not too uh, difficult to imagine that actually this is not usually how healthcare operates. If uh, a GP or healthcare team gets a patient or sees a patient in front of them, they're interested in a holistic view of, of their care and what might happen to that patient, not just um, single outcomes. And so in my view, there seems to be a, a disconnect between how the models are, are used or want to be used uh, and how they're actually uh, developed in practice. So I just have two motivating examples to, to illustrate what I mean by that. The first of which comes from um, atrial fibrillation, where clinical teams are constantly weighing um, the, the prescription of uh, anticoagulants, um, where they weigh the risk of stroke against the risk of, of bleeding. And obviously they want to prescribe um, anticoagulants in those that are at high risk of stroke, but uh, at low risk of, of bleeding. And so to do that, what's available is um, many risk models um, to predict stroke, one of which is the Chad Duvas score. Um, and there are also many other models that are available to predict the risk uh, of bleeding. But as I've said, the, the key interest, in, uh, interest here from a clinical side of things is, is the risk of these two events happening simultaneously, so the, the joint risk of, of those events. And it's important to note uh, statistically that that's not necessarily just the, the, uh, the result of multiplying those two models uh, together or the output from those two models together. And I'll, I'll come back to that, that idea uh, later on. The second example is, is a little bit different, but this is more where we're interested in um, an outcome that we want to split uh, granularity. So uh, an example of this is in the context of, of cancer, um, whereby what we might be interested in predicting is whether a patient's tumor is benign, borderline, primary invasive or metastatic, rather than simply whether that uh, tumor is cancerous or not. Okay, so a more granular level of, uh, of information. So I would class this still as a multiple outcome because you have those, those multiple levels rather than it just being a, a, a binary. Now, this type of, of multiple outcome is particularly of interest if the clinical management um, differs uh, according to that, that granular risk assessment, uh, as is the case here. So in my view, both of those examples show how there's this clinical interest in predicting multiple things, uh, and again, how that might not marry up with how models are, are developed. But it also is useful in, in the sense, statistically, in, in distinguishing between different types of multiple outcome, or what I might mean by uh, multiple outcome. So the first is, is often called uh, multi-class outcomes, where the individual can experience one of multiple possible outcomes or events uh, where each of those is, is mutually exclusive. And that would be akin to the uh, second example there of, of cancer, uh, tumor type, sorry. Slightly different to that would be a multi-label outcome. So this is where we're interested in predicting across uh, multiple things that might happen 
but where the occurrence of one of those things doesn't necessarily uh, prevent any of the others. And that would be uh, like the, the first most big example of uh, atrial fibrillation. And it's this second um, type of outcome that I'm going to be talking about today. So within that setting, what we're um, currently in a situation of is, is illustrated on this slide. So if we're interested in trying to predict the risk of uh, two things happening, so A and B say, what currently happens is we have a model uh, that's developed and validated for the first, uh, and correspondingly for uh, outcome B, and we can generate the risks from both of those things. And currently what we would do if we're interested in what's the probability of a patient having A and B, we would uh, multiply those risks uh, together. But we know from sort of probability 101 that that's only valid if, if those two events are uh, conditionally independent. And this is where things start to break down in, in healthcare in the sense that usually what happens to, to one patient uh, is, you know, it depends on, on what happens to them in, in the future. And so uh, uh, a lot of my work is um, focused on trying to, to use modeling approaches that cor correctly account for the potential correlation between the outcomes, thereby uh, allowing uh, an accurate estimate of uh, this joint risk, so the probability of, of both things happening, for instance. And so one way in which we can do that is to treat the, the combinations of each outcome uh, as a nominal outcome category uh, and pass that through uh, a multinomial uh, logistic regression model as so here. So you can see here that uh, for each combination, I've got two binary outcomes in this uh, illustration, Y1 and Y2. And so there are the four possible outcomes or combinations of what might happen for a patient. Uh, and so you can make a, a three-level multinomial logistic model, regressing all of the predictors uh, against uh, those categories, uh, and from which you can get accurate estimates of, of that joint risk. Now, for, for anyone that's statistically minded in, in the audience, and I guess that's most of you, you're probably thinking, well, um, this is not a new idea. Um, multivariate or multi-outcome uh, regression or modeling has been around for many decades, and, and that is indeed true. And that's just illustrated on some of the slide, uh, citations on this slide. I think what I'm interested in and, and what this paper was doing is, is thing, thinking, well, if we're in a prediction context, how what wrong can things go if we you know, take this current approach of just multiplying the risks together versus more complex, um, but more statistically accurate um, methods? And that's what this paper was, was aiming to, to do. So this slide, I'm not gonna to spend too long on, uh, just in the interests of time, um, but essentially we compared within the paper two approaches that apply that sort of uh, standard way, uh, that only rely on conditional independence, and compared that against uh, four methods that uh, relax that assumption and, and correctly model the, uh, the multiple outcomes. And what we found um, within that paper, so that the, um, the figure here is just from a simulation in that, that paper, uh, where we had all of the, the methods on the, on the models on the x-axis uh, and different performance measures on the, the y-axis. Uh, and each panel is uh, a level of uh, correlation between the outcomes. So when the uh, panel zero, the, the two outcomes are conditionally independent uh, and, and vice versa. And what we want is for the, the top row of plots, the, the value to be zero and the bottom row of plots, the value to be one. And what we can see is that the methods that um, rely on uh, in conditional independence um, start to do quite badly, okay? And, and what this is saying is that um, and the top right here where it's showing is that the, the risk of both of those outcomes happening is being uh, systematically over, um, Underpredicted, sorry. Okay, so we're underpredicting that that joint risk, okay, and, and you're only getting accurate estimates of joint risk when you uh, correctly model that that correlation. So that's probably unsurprising to, to many of you from a from a stats perspective. Um, but what's of interest to me is that this you know isn't commonly used in, in a prediction field. 
And so what I'm currently working on is, is trying to address that, that situation in the sense of trying to create both the methodology to, to underpin the use of these types of methods in prognostic modeling, um, but then also thinking about that from a more applied research perspective uh, and creating sort of guidance papers in that, that space to, to try and make this more accessible for, for a wider audience. I'm going to close the, the talk with just a, a link to, to multimorbidity, which I know is of interest to, to many people, um, in the sense that this idea of predicting risk of, of multiple things happening is, um, is directly what's of interest in, in multimorbidity research. So if we're trying to, to predict or diagnose who has or who will develop uh, multiple long-term conditions, um, then you can essentially apply a lot of the techniques that we've been talking about um, to that setting. Obviously, within a, a context of multimorbidity, what we have is the, the added element of time in, in this, this space. So people are developing conditions uh, through, their, through their life course. And so what I'm saying is that we can use methods called uh, multi-state uh, prediction models um, to, to do that. And so you treat each state in that model as the diagnosis of the condition in a cumulative sense. Uh, and from that, you can get all of the different joint probabilities that I was talking about uh, up until that point in time. I think what's particularly interesting in this space is that there are a range of, uh, of challenges um, that are probably um, preventing both uh, the stuff from earlier in my talk, um, but also this, uh, this third example of, of multimorbidity prediction. Uh, and these are some of the things that I'm, I'm trying to tackle uh, within a, uh, an MRC project that's about halfway through at the moment. So I'm not going to go through each of them in time, but just to, in each of them in turn, but just to pick out a, a couple of salient ones, um, things like how do we deal with different outcome types? So not just this idea of whether somebody does or doesn't have a, a condition, but um, you know, if, if diseases are more on a continuum rather than binary, um, and then also linked to what Matt will talk about uh, shortly after me, this idea of how do we then act upon the decisions from these types of models, which requires more counterfactual reasoning. And, and Matt will talk a lot more about that than, than I can. So just to, to sum up then, um, I would say multiple outcomes should be considered more widely in, in risk prediction modeling, especially when we're interested in, in this joint risk. Uh, there are lots of methods uh, available to do that. Um, but I think this disconnect between the, sort of the stats world and the prediction modeling world needs to be bridged through uh, both methods research and uh, guidance papers and, and hopefully some of my work can, uh, can try and tackle that. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Glenn. Uh, excellent overview there. Um, so I think we've got a question from uh, Ken in the chat here. Um, can these be methods be applied to genomic data where you might want to use multiple polygenic risk scores to predict multiple disease outcomes? And does genetic data imply this? Does the genetic data have any sort of additional considerations over uh, the kind of stuff that it's? Yeah, thanks. That's that's an interesting question. I think um, I, I personally don't have any experience of um, applying these methods in, in the context of um, genomic data, but I, I can't see why they wouldn't. Um, I guess one challenge would be the, the computational. Uh, burden of that and, and the number of parameters that are feeding into to those types of models. Um, but uh, yeah, let, let's indeed discuss it in, in due course, Ken, because it would be super, super interesting, I think. I've got a question myself, Glenn. Um, does the... Um, do the models where you get this improved uh, joint uh, kind of prediction, are they also better at marginal prediction or does it make no difference on the marginal prediction quality to do the joint inference? Yeah, that's, that's really interesting actually. So um, 
from that paper that when we looked at that, it, it didn't actually make any difference in terms of the marginal prediction. Um, it, it was all in the, in the joint uh, estimates, which I guess is, is perhaps what we might expect. Um, some other work so, um, from separate groups has shown that it can actually help with predictor selection within some of those, those groups. So by looking at the sort of the more granular information, you can actually, you know, through the predictors, predictor selection, get a more tailored model for the, for the marginal outcome in, in that setting. But that's not something we, we looked at. Um, but it's, yeah, I think it's interesting. Does that, does it also help you, like if you can condition on some of the other conditions? Um, so now you've got a joint model, does that allow you to condition properly? Yeah, it definitely does. And, and that, you know, particularly in, in sort of the multimorbidity type of example that I talked about. So, you know, once you've developed one condition, so once you've developed type two diabetes, say, you know, and condition on that at time of prediction, you know, you, you can then obviously, well, perhaps get a, a more accurate prediction of, of then future cardiovascular risk, for instance. Someone's asked in the chat, um, how do you evaluate a multi-disease prediction, e.g., you know, what's the sort of analog of an ROC score, um, where different parts of predictions may work better than other parts? Yes, yeah, so there's lots of different methods that are being proposed to, to extend all those sort of classic binary classification type assessments to, to this world. So the, the analog to uh, the ROC or area under the curve mm -hmm. Uh, more generally would be the something called the PDI, um, which essentially just takes the AEC and applies that to, to multiple outcome levels. Um, and the, the corresponding things for things like calibration as well, uh, which is all what I was showing on the, the slide. So um, my impression is that a lot of these risk prediction scores work pretty well with a sort of generalized linear type model, you know, logistic regression or multinomial wins. Does that mean that highly nonlinear models like you might see in deep learning approaches aren't that useful in this kind of domain, do you think? Or what's your impression about the types of model that work well here? Yeah, another interesting question, Marcus. I, th I, think, um, I think actually to some extent, some of those other methods that you mentioned do a better job of of doing this than sort of classic regression so um a lot of the you know the network type models you can you can easily extend it where it's it directly outputs the, the multiple layers um whereas you know within a regression framework you need to formally specify the correlation structure um so in some sense it does it better but i'll try to just you know strengths and weaknesses of, of both i would say interesting uh, any more questions from anyone Great to see some questions in the chat. Keep putting questions in there. Um, and uh, let's uh, thank uh, Glenn. Um, see if I can work out a way to do it with some virtual clapping. Um, and uh, next up, we have Matt. Matt's also from the School of Health. Uh, Division of Informatics, Imaging and Data Sciences. And Matt is going to talk about uh, a very hot topic of uh, the role of, uh, so uh, let's hear, can, can we do it? Can we do causal inference? Matt's going to tell us. Thanks, Magnus. It sounds like um, the storm is potentially getting a bit worse up in Scotland. So uh, <laughs> a, a bit of delay on your voice. Um, yeah, so, so um, I'm Matt Sperrin, I'm a senior lecturer at um, Manchester University and I have um, quite a range of interests really in, um, in a number of areas of um, methodology for prediction, um, including a lot of work that overlaps with, uh, with Glenn who was just speaking, the two of us worked together quite a bit. Um, but today I've chosen to speak about um, something that I think is very interesting but I don't necessarily know many of the answers to, um, which is um, the role of uh, causality in prediction models. So Glenn has already introduced um, prediction models, so, so that saves me from uh, dwelling on that too much. Um, but um, I will introduce one in the context of um, 
the uh, example at the time going to, uh, to in, in terms of an example that motivates this idea. So I think Glenn um, mentioned Q risk, which is quite a commonly used um, risk prediction model that's used in primary care in the UK, calculates risk, uh, cardiovascular risk. Um, and I, I, I guess the, where I'm sort of going with this is that, is that when we make these predictions, typically we're making these predictions because we want to support a decision. We're, we're not just learning what our risk is um, of cardiovascular disease just for interest. If it's high, then presumably some action is going to be taken. So we have um, this um, hypothetical patient here called Joe, who's various risk factors that have been entered into this calculator, and that gives some information about um, his cardiovascular risk. And clearly what happens now is that Joe or his uh, clinician are now going to essentially pose potentially a series of questions. Um, and they're what if questions. So, um, so we've got this cardiovascular risk of 17%, so a 17% risk of developing a heart attack or stroke over the next 10 years. So we might say, well, what if I stopped smoking? How much would that reduce my risk? Or what if I lost some weight? Uh, what if I reduced my blood pressure, um, perhaps by taking an antihypertensive? Or what if I uh, took a, a cholesterol lowering medication like a statin? Um, so, so, so what we know, um, well, anecdotally at least, happens um, when these models are used um, in clinical practice um, is what you might call a plug-in or um, conditional probability type approach. So, so what will happen is, um, in, to answer the first question, what if I stop smoking, um, the person using the tool might say, okay, well, let's just go back to um, the inputs that we put into the model, change current smoker to X smoker, and that will give me a new and different probability of the outcome. And perhaps we can interpret that as, um, you know, as, as the sort of, as the risk, as what the risk would be if we intervened and, and stopped smoking. And the difference between the, the you know, the, the risk we've calculated and that new risk uh, could be the effect of smoking. Um, so that doesn't work. Um, and you know, the, the, so the, the reason it doesn't work is, is just purely because these are prediction models. They're not designed to answer these kind of questions. You know, the, the coefficients of uh, an arbitrary regression model or, or, or um, any sort of model of this kind just don't have that interpretation and, and changing the inputs won't give us this interpretation in general. Um, this is closely related to what's called the table two fallacy, which is about if you're even if you're interested in a particular causal effect, you can't then go looking at the other um, betas uh, or hazard ratios in your model and interpreting those as well. So, um, you know, and it's, as I should say, you know, this is no critique of the users of these models. This, this seems an entirely reasonable thing to do um, to, to use this plug in approach. But yeah, unfortunately, it doesn't work and it doesn't work because essentially there could be unmeasured confounding factors. There could be mediating factors. So perhaps stopping smoking causes you to uh, gain weight and that would need to take into account too. So in short, um, causality is needed to solve problems of this kind. So because we're asking what if questions, we're talking about what happens if an intervention is made, then we need causality. Um, so. I mean, here's an, th this example, this is just showing, uh, this is another web tool that pretty much explicitly allows you to do this sort of plug-in approach and compare the risks. So here on the left, we have a, a high blood pressure and on the right, another calculation with the blood pressure changed. So, so we can see that this sort of thing is happening. And as I say, it's, you know, it's no criticism of the users of these tools, um, you know, that, that this is happening. Um, I'll skip that one. Um, and of course, you know, as, as I was saying, the essentially the problem here is that a prediction model is just entirely focused on um, on making accurate predictions. So a prediction model can be essentially thought of as a black box. Um, so I mean, I'm oversimplifying a bit um, saying this, but uh, you know, this is essentially why we can use all these fancy machine learning methods that. Uh, that Magnus was hinting at in his question to Glenn before. Um, 
you know, we, we can use a deep learning algorithm or something because we don't necessarily care what's happening under the hood of this model, we just want an accurate prediction. Whereas when we're doing causal inference, we're typically very uh, concerned about the role and of, of all the variables and the causal relationships between them all so that we can appropriately estimate the uh, causal effects that we're interested in. So besides being able to use models um, to explicitly get these sorts of contrasts, um, so some people might argue, well, OK, if I use a risk score that, uh, that tells me that a risk is high, then I just know that I need to take some steps to reduce that risk. Um, and the challenge there is that it, it can become a bit unclear what the estimand is of, of, um, of such a prediction model. So to show that, think about this example. So suppose we have um, an individual with some baseline variables L and we predict an outcome Y, which might be cardiovascular disease. Um, and the key point is, is how the model predicts that outcome is it's based on historical data um, from patients who received certain care and certain interventions. Um, so patients with high blood pressure in the past, um, in the development data for the model, will still have received some kind of intervention uh, to address the high blood pressure, for example. So that would have the effect of um, attenuating uh, the risk of high blood pressure as it appears in a model like this, in the sense that um, you know, it's, it's telling us the risk if we um, intervened in a similar way to how we intervened with patients in the past. So the estimand, if you like, that um, a prediction model is estimating, if we, if we think about this in a, in a slightly more causal way, is it's uh, the estimand gives the predicted outcome, given that we intervene in the same way that we intervened in the development data. So if, if generally patients with high blood pressure were treated for that high blood pressure, um, the prediction is of somebody with high blood pressure from the model is telling us what their risk of cardiovascular disease would be, given that we intervene uh, to treat the high blood pressure, similarly to how we did before. Um, and the reason this is a problem is because um, it, it doesn't seem that people interpret these kind of models in that way. So typically these models are interpreted as what would the predicted be risk if I don't do anything, if, if I don't act at all. So if we calculate um, a cardiovascular risk for a patient and it comes out as 20 percent, then we assume that that's what happens if, you know, if I don't, if, if you don't try and lose weight or um, lower your blood pressure, this is your risk. But actually that could be the risk of cardiovascular disease, even if, despite your efforts to reduce blood pressure and lose weight. Um, so that is arguably not very intuitive and it's perhaps more useful if these prediction models were actually to report um, the predicted risk, assuming that we did nothing. But in order to prepare such a prediction, in order to produce such a prediction, we need to use some causal inference methodology because we're now asking a question about it because doing nothing is an intervention and we're, we're thinking explicitly about what happens under that intervention. So we need causal inference to tackle uh, that kind of problem. So just to give a, a brief COVID example, um, so a number of scores developed over the last um, well, nearly two years or so now to, um, to sort of triage patients or calculate risks of patients um, of getting or having bad outcomes from COVID-19 in various contexts. So here's an example of um, a model that's used in a hospital triage context. So patients arrive at hospital with, um, with a positive uh, COVID test and they have COVID symptoms. Um, and the suggestion here, is that um, we calculate their mortality score under this model. And if that's very low, then we can send them home. And that may be okay, but, but what you have to remember is that um, this, uh, this low um, mortality risk for that individual is based on historical data for patients treated in the hospital, not those ones that were sent home. So by sending them home, we're changing that risk, we're raising it compared with um, 
with that quoted mortality rate, perhaps. Uh, and the third motivation that I think is interesting, which is similar to the second one, really, um, but just a slight extension of it in terms of the causal sophistication of the question. Um, so we argued before that we're interested in the do nothing risk. Um, but when we're calculating, say, cardiovascular risk for individuals, we're interested in that risk over a 10 year period into the future. So then that raises the question, what do we mean by do nothing? Because it could mean we do nothing today, but then tomorrow we immediately start treating, um, intervening on all the uh, risk factors. So if we're explicitly interested in the do nothing regime as being, for example, doing nothing today and continuing to do nothing for the next 10 years, then we're now in a slightly more complex scenario from a, a causal perspective um, that you know, we're imagining uh, you know, a, an intervention that is happening over time. Um, and that means we need to use some slightly more sophisticated causal machinery. You know, nothing, nothing that uh, isn't very well understood and studied in, in causal inference, but uh, you know, an extra thing to think about um, in the context of prediction. So um, addressing these questions effectively requires making predictions under interventions. So we can't just sort of use our historical data and predict based on what happened in the historical data if we're interested in these kind of questions. Um, so this is a fairly, you know, doing this in a predictive modeling context is a, is a fairly new idea. So we, uh, we carry out a, a scoping review of the literature um, over the last um, couple of years or so um, to identify where people have essentially explicitly done this. So explicitly um, enriched uh, prediction models with some uh, causal techniques in order to um, be able to predict under intervention. Um, and when we studied the literature, we found broadly uh, two uh, approaches for doing this. So the first is essentially where you more or less keep the prediction part and the causal effect estimation quite separate um, and only combine them at the very end. And the second is where you essentially try and build a model all in one go that, um, that is doing both the prediction part and the uh, causal inference part. So the simple, well, arguably the simplest way is the first one, which is to do those two things separately. So. The, the very simplest way you could do this is, um, is sort of forget about the uh, problem of um, this, this do nothing s demand that, um, that we talked about before and say, okay, we get a prediction. And if we have a causal effect from somewhere else, that tells us how we should adjust that prediction to reflect the effect of an intervention. So in Q risk, for example, if we have a Q risk of um, 25%, um, we know that, say, a statin would reduce that risk by 20% on a relative scale, which translates to um, uh, a 5% absolute reduction if you're at 25%, so a new risk of 20%. And, um, and that's mostly a reasonable thing to do, apart from the fact that um, there might be some sort of miscalibration in both of those estimates because we assumed that... Um, the one that we originally calculated, the 25%, um, was based on not using the statins at all. Whereas if in our historical data statins were prescribed post baseline, then that would be uh, slightly off. Um, so, so that's a, a very crude way of doing it. Um, a slightly more sophisticated way is used by um, a model called PREDICT, the PREDICT breast cancer score. Um, which um, essentially fixes the coefficients of, um, so essentially they estimate a regression model, they have um, terms in there for various treatments, and rather than estimate the, the coefficients of those particular terms for the treatments, they're essentially set to the, uh, the relevant effect that's estimated from the clinical trials. So that that's essentially overcomes that problem. Um, I mean, it, it's still a reasonably crude thing to do and does raise some, um, a few other questions about, um, uh, you know, for example, how, you know, the, how sort of transferable the causal effects from the trials are into the real data 
that's being used. But you know, on the whole, that is about the most sophisticated thing that, that's actually done in practice to address this problem in terms of models that are actually used to, uh, to make decisions um, on the ground in, in healthcare. And then the slightly more complicated approach is um, to um, essentially build a model purely using the observational data that both does the, um, the prediction part and estimates the uh, causal effects all in one go. Um, so that can be done um, for point or baseline treatments only, so building a model in treated and untreated individuals, and then essentially the difference between those is interpreted as the causal effect. Um, so that requires some fairly strong assumptions, um, namely that the um, essentially all the all the sort of prognostic factors are also the right things to adjust for when we're um, generating when, when we're estimating our causal effects. Um, and that idea can, can be extended reasonably straightforwardly to treatment over time, um, as long as you, instead of using sort of regression adjustment methods, you um, use the sort of G methods instead, things like marginal structural models, which, um, which essentially allow you to have um, interventions over time and potential treatment confounder feedback. In other words, treatment at time zero can affect confounders at time one, etc which you know, is, a, is a slightly more difficult problem to hold to, to solve, but as I say, very well understood in the causal inference literature. So another um, aspect that I think is very interesting here is um, what's sometimes called the prediction paradox, uh, or in machine learning, this is called performative prediction. And this is where essentially the act of making a prediction affects uh, the predictions themselves. Um, so the picture on the left, this is um, Harry Seldon from um, Isaac Asimov's uh, Foundation series, which is a science fiction um, series. And essentially Harry Seldon um, can predict the future, um, but the caveat is that he can't tell anyone what those predictions are, because if he tells anyone what the predictions are, then they no longer come true. Uh, and you can see that the same sort of thing can happen um, in healthcare. So as soon as you predict risk in some in an individual, they change their behavior to modify that risk. Or a stronger, another sort of version of that is what's laid out in these bullets. So if you imagine you have um, a high, a, a, a group of patients who have high risk if no action is taken. Um, so we have some historical data where we didn't know any, anything to do about these high risk patients. So now we fit a model and that those patients will be classified as high risk. Um, we deploy that model into practice. And because those patients are now high risk, we think we'd better intervene on them. Um, and we do so and avoid bad outcomes. Um, now we realize that our new model is not doing so well at predicting because um, it's over predicting, particularly in these sorts of groups. So we refit the model. Um, this group of patients is now classified as low risk, which seems appropriate because not many of them are having the outcome. But the problem is that this new model now goes into practice. These patients are then calculated as being at low risk and therefore we think, okay, look, you don't need to intervene on those patients. Um, and then they have bad outcomes again. So you get into these sort of oscillations um, between um, intervening and not intervening in certain groups. Which again, you know, if you think about this problem causally, that avoids those sorts of problems. Um, and a couple of other uh, thing potential benefits that uh, that that um, you know, we're, we're thinking about, and, and I think could be quite interesting. So the first one is um, embedding, you know, thinking about fairness of decisions based on prediction models. So this is um, so th thinking about this from the perspective of if we have, say, people from different um, ethnic groups or men versus women, then um, in what ways should those protected characteristics influence our prediction or the way that we act based on a predict prediction from a model? 
So the classic example of thinking about this kind of fairness is in um, prison sentencing. So there, um, if we consider ethnicity when we're deciding a prison sentence, then I think you can clearly see, clearly you'd argue that's not a, a good or fair thing to do. You know, somebody, um, a sentence received by um, an individual who's black African say, then if we imagine counterfactually that they were white and that in that case they would have received a different sentence, then that's clearly not appropriate. Now in health clearly things are, are not quite so clear because um, if ethnicity really is acting as a proxy for risk, but, you know, other unmeasured things we don't know about, then perhaps then it is appropriate to treat um, people from different ethnic groups differently, depending on that risk, because we're, um, you know, respond, you know, we're acting in their best interests potentially. But there are still some complications and unanswered questions there. And then I think the other area that's quite promising is um, thinking about the generalizability or transportability of prediction models. So we always have this problem. We develop prediction models in one population, and we always want to apply them somewhere else because the, um, you know, the population that we've developed the risk prediction model in have already had the outcomes. So clearly we at least want to transport the model forward in time. Um, so, you know, a, a sort of nice um, sentence, well, a nice quote from Judea Pearl, one of the causal inference um, uh, experts, is that if you change from one domain to another, that's like imposing an intervention. So you can sort of see that thinking about that from a causal perspective um, could potentially allow us to improve generalizability of prediction models in theory. And then I appreciate that the whole talk has been more about saying some in, you know, interesting areas and unanswered questions, but uh, you know, hopefully people can uh, discuss those with me um, as, as we work on this going forwards. But I think some of the key unanswered questions. Um, so one is about validation. And I guess this is partly to do with two different schools of thought on what validation means coming together. So from a causal inference perspective, um, you can clearly never validate a counterfactual in the sense that, you know, asking questions like, you know, I took statins and I didn't have a heart attack. Would I have had a heart attack if if I didn't take the statins. So, so those kind of questions are, well, are unanswerable using observed data and you have to make some fairly strong assumptions to, to answer them in, in any case. Um, so, but, but in prediction modeling, the way that models are validated is very much based on the observed data. So I, I think that does raise some questions about what we should mean about validating predictions when we're thinking about predictions under different possible interventions for an individual. Um, and the second is triangulating methods from multiple sources. So I hinted earlier that a promising way to solve these problems is by, um, by say, taking some data from a tri clinical trial and dropping that into your model that's using observational data. But, um, the ways that that's done at the moment are usually quite crude, although there is some research in this area. And then, of course, the, you know, the natural sort of complexity extension that in general, we want to consider multiple possible uh, treatments or interventions in one go and, and complex policies underpinning those treatments in time. So I'll finish there just to give the brief summary that prediction models cannot be interpreted causally, but being able to predict under interventions seems to be useful when we're using those prediction models to make decisions. But there are a few unanswered questions around how to do this, which I think is why this isn't necessarily done. Um, and, and just personally, I think that where we do have external causal effects that might be useful, it seems to make sense to make use of those. Just a final um, thing to mention is um, that along with um, Hui Guo, uh, Claudia, Claude, Claudia Lidner and some others, um, we're organizing a causal inference workshop on the 25th of January. Um, Magnus has secured some pump priming funding, um, which can support some postdoc time. Um, and there'll be a call following on from this workshop. And the, the, the general idea of the workshop will be to 
bring together problem holders and methodology experts in causal inference. But, um, but further details will follow, but for now it's just a, a sort of save the date if you're particularly interested in this. Uh, so that's all from me. Great, thank you, Matt. Um, so uh, Ken has a question and I think I'll pass over to Ken to ask it. Hi. Um... Thanks, Matt. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and the question's in the chat, but uh, I think Magnus's connection is, is a little poor. So the, the basic question was uh, your views on Mendelian randomization as a way of defining causality for some of these factors. And if you believe in Mendelian randomization, or if you get a strong signal from it that the factor is causal, can you use that in an equivalent way to what you were describing for the PREDICT model uh, and does that sort of fall into your sort of final conclusion about um, triangulation with Bayesian methods because there's, there's a lot of work going on using Mendelian randomization to define causal factors but that's the sort of end of the story so if there's a way of adding that back in to make these models more causal rather than associations uh, that would be interesting to explore but welcome your views on that yeah I, I think that's absolutely a promising direction so clearly from you know if, if we're talking about a statin then we can use a clinical trial to get an estimate of the effect of the statin but if we're talking about um modifying a risk factor like weight or um you know alcohol consumption or something then we know that that's very hard to assess through you know, unless we have a specific intervention in mind that's quite hard to assess through a trial so i think mendelian randomization is a really good way to get a hint on what the effects of modifying those um exposures uh, may be so yeah i certainly think you know if you think about this as sticking bits together if, yep. you know you know i guess it, the approach would be broadly agnostic to where exactly you estimate that causal effect from whether you're using trial data or um, a mendelian randomization study yeah no it's very helpful it'd be very interesting to pick this up at the workshop as well great thanks okay do we have any more questions for matt um doesn't look like it, but um, we now know there's a workshop coming. Um, hopefully that information didn't cause people to not ask questions, but um, who knows? Um, so uh, yeah, I, I think that workshop would be uh, great for people interested in causal inference. So please look out for uh, on the IDSI website and we'll be advertising that so that people can sign up. Um, and I'd just like to thank Matt and Glenn uh, once more um, for two great talks um, on very interesting areas of risk prediction and causal inference. So, so thanks again, Matt and Glenn. And I believe we have another Turing Spotlight session next week. So uh, have a look on the IDSI website. You'll be able to see who's talking and sign up for next week. And I hope to see many of you there. So. Bye-bye.